the president, too, reminding us that this accomplishment is that of a community. As the historian Daniel Borston reminded us the other day, when they came in the Mayflower, they came in community. When they went out, as the president suggested, on the Oregon Trail, they went as a community. And when they went into space, they went as a community. You please rise and join in the singing of America the Beautiful. You can dig into the second verse of America the Beautiful to look for words which are perhaps eminently suitable for today. O oh, beautiful for pilgrim feet whose stern impassioned stress a thoroughfare for freedom beat across the wilderness. And across the skies missing man formation. Ellison Onizuka having, as we could only understand her having today, a very difficult time. Like her husband, she's a Buddhist. They come from the big island of Hawaii. And she is here today with her children, Janelle and Darianne. The flyby with NASA's T-38s on which the astronauts train as the president who with Mrs. Reagan has been sitting this morning very close to the families. seen it before at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, just a couple of months ago, where the president's mere presence
Mrs. Onizuka. Lieutenant Colonel Ellison's mother. He, Ellison, who always took macadamia nuts and Kona coffee for the people at Mission Control. Ronald McNair's wife, Cheryl. And Reginald, who will be four in two weeks. Of whom the president said this morning, of Ronald, that is, he learned perseverance and dedication in the cotton fields of South Carolina. Born in Lake City, a presidential scholar, a black belt karate instructor, the second black American to fly in space. It is more, as we have seen before, than the simple power of the presidency. President and Mrs. Reagan seem to give a gift of warmth, which at this terrible moment, in the spotlight for the families, these, president, these families will hopefully treasure for a long time. After the disaster at Gander in Newfoundland, the president met every family member in Fort Campbell of the 250 men and women who had died flying back from their peace mission in the Middle East. Donaldson, it is terribly hard on families, as we know. It looks as if it's very hard on the president. Well, I'm sure it is, Peter. As uh, we said, he met with the, the families who were here before the uh, memorial service. And I have a report on a little bit about what happened. It was a meeting in that building right behind uh, where the uh, microphones are set up. Uh, the president, Mrs. Reagan, came in the room. Uh, he spoke to each one of the uh, members of the families present, as did uh, Mrs. Reagan. Private words, uh, some hugs, uh, some handshakes. And then the president said to them, now, uh, I wish there were something I could say to make it easier, but there just aren't any words. We sorrow more for ourselves and in the fact that we will miss them. This should be tempered by the joy that they are receiving the blessings God reserved for them. We shall all see them together again. And uh, we're told that there were some tears, uh, the family members held hands, the older children placed their arms around their mothers, and then they came out to, to the services we've just seen. As Lynn Schur was making eminently clear to us a little earlier in the broadcast, here at the Johnson Space Center, but at other places around the country, at the Cape, at Huntsville, Alabama, in California, those people who have worked, and particularly for the last few years, in far greater anonymity than they did at the beginning of the space shuttle program, have gathered together to comfort one another. This is, of course, not the first disaster that has been. 1967, we'll recall, when Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chafee died in a fire on the pad as part of the Apollo program. <laughs> 